there's a certain division of labor here, um, and uh, I was originally going to say something about U.S. policy, but in view of Allen's and uh, Noam Chomsky's uh, expertise in this field, I'm going to uh, talk about something different. <clears throat> and that is what, <clears throat> in my view, is Indonesian's uh, policy in East Timor, uh, something about why the massacre actually occurred and why I think basically <clears throat> the game is already over from the point of view of Jakarta. <clears throat> Let me begin with a story. I'm going to make this as short as I can, <clears throat> which some of you may be aware of, which is that last month, uh, a sm small, sort of looked like a Mississippi ferry boat, uh, was chartered uh, with Portuguese uh, funding to sail uh, on a mission from the north of Australia into the harbor at Dili with the express idea of uh, laying uh, wreaths, expressing solidarity with the people who were killed in the massacre. And on this boat, I think not more than 100 um, students, journalists uh, of different countries and so forth. Basically, uh, people who wanted to express some kind of solidarity. This is a very small boat, not uh, armed in any way at all. Well, this boat, uh, at first sight, seemed to throw the Indonesian government into a complete panic. <clears throat> uh, the head of the Navy said, you know, major preparations were underway. The whole Navy was going to be thrown into the effort to stop this necessarily a ferry boat from penetrating subversively into the Indonesian waters. Uh, the police, the army, the marines all chimed in. And to a, rather to my astonishment, <clears throat> the newspapers showed detailed, as it were, plans for the defense of Dili, uh, of East Timor, against this, uh, this dangerous invasion. <clears throat> but what's really interesting in <clears throat> is this, that in the accounts given by the general who uh, uh, Alan referred to, uh, General Teo Shafei, who's just moved in to replace uh, the previous commander, uh, he said that we have uh, three battle lines to defend the capital of East Timor against the invasion. And the three battle lines, of course, first was the Indonesian Navy out there patrolling the waters with guns uh, uh, ready. The next battle line was a uh, slight come down, it's the immigration offices and uh, the police. And, and then the third one that really counted, of course, is the military. So you had a three-line defense against the, this invasion, an invasion from the one of 1975. But this had its sort of comic aspects to it. But what is very interesting is what then followed, because as the general began to talk on and on and on, he began to use a very strange kind of language, which I've never seen. I've been watching Indonesian politics for a long time, uh, 25 years probably. And he began to use a language about what was going on in East Timor, which was really quite interesting. Because for years, the Indonesian generals have been saying, well, it's all over by the shouting. Uh, there's just a few uh, guerrillas up in the hills, just two or three there, have got no guns left. It's all finished, it's all finished, it's all finished. Do you hear me? It's all finished, and so forth. And what the general now is saying is something quite extraordinary. What he is saying is that we have to be very careful, because if the boat arrives in the harbor, then there might be a, a muck by the masses. Uh, and it would be extremely dangerous if the masses, he always uses this word, masa, uh, would get out of hand. Uh, we recognize that the masa are very difficult to face. It's the task of every uh, military officer to understand how to face the masa. No explanation, of course, where these masses uh, have come from. And this, it seems to me, is very striking because in, uh, that this very hardline officer, in fact, is no longer talking the language of three, four people up in the hills, but is talking about masses who have to be a three-line defense. It really has to be set up against is in fact a backhanded recognition of what is now increasingly clear to people, I think, in the military themselves. That the gamble that was taken in 1975, that you could go in there, take over this place, uh, kill off what was necessary in the terms of resistance, uh, frighten the population, and then what you would do, the next step would be to fully absorb it into the country. 
And it's important to understand what that absorption I involves. The calculation is, and it's an old calculation of occupying forces in many countries around the world, you get rid of the guys who are in power, you terrify the rest of the population, and then, because you don't want to kill everybody in the eyes, and there's no point in that, what you do, what you want to do, is to get the kids. And you won't understand Indonesian policy in Teach Timor unless you realize that alongside the prison camps, alongside the executions, alongside the torture, alongside the genocidal populations at certain points, there is also, and this is very typical of colonialism, you find it in British French colonialism, you, you do genocide and you educate. You torture and you build roads. Uh, it's a very classical policy, and in fact, what has actually happened in East Timor under uh, Indonesian rule is that, in fact, a lot of roads have been built, and that a lot of office buildings. Dili now is a city in four or five times the size of what it was when the Indonesians invaded. Many, many, many Timorese have, in fact, been put in school, told to read Indonesian books, taught Indonesian languages, and then, of course, find that there's no jobs for them when they get out of the... Uh, schooling system. Timorese kids have been sent to universities in Indonesia, in Java, just as the Dutch used to send Indonesian students to study in Holland. Um, Indonesians um, have, uh, up to a certain point, permitted the church to operate, and that has meant that the church has now about twice as many people in Timor as faithful followers of the church as it had at the time of the invasion. It is what I'm really trying to say here is that the irony of this is that Indonesia has actually done exactly what the Dutch and the French and the British colonials did before them. Same calculations are there. And what they are finding is what they should have realized, actually, if they'd looked at their own history. The Dutch colonized Indonesia for 300 years, brutalized it, exploited it, tortured, murdered, but they also built roads. They also constructed factories. They also began late in the game, but they definitely did, to put them in school. And of course, it's precisely out of the schools, precisely out of the newspapers, precisely out of the modernization of life in the colony that the Indonesian nationalist movement emerged, which could never be turned back. It was only a matter of time before Indonesia would become an independent state. And I think what's happened in the last 10, 15 years I have to say this frankly, that you know, eight or nine years ago, nine, ten years ago, when I used to go on talks like this, I was very pessimistic. I thought maybe the gamble might pay off, that so much deterioration, so much damage had been done to the Indian Timorese that it was finished. But now I think the evidence is clear that, in fact, it's the Indonesian policy that's finished. There's no way of getting this back now. They've lost the younger generation. Kids. Those are the kids who were in the demonstration. Notice that many of those children were under 17 years old, under 20 years old. If so, they don't even remember the pre-Indonesian period. Here carpetbaggers coming in to a small town which was traditionally theirs. I mean, they're perfectly aware of what's going on. And that consciousness, that solidarity, can't be destroyed and can't be turned back. Last uh, May, I think it was, the SSRC sponsored a meeting on East Timor in Washington, which, rather to our surprise, a senior Indonesian military intelligence officer showed up. But um, the most interesting person at that meeting was a young man called Donanciano Gomez, uh, a boy about 19 years old who'd actually been a leader of the uh, organized protests to try and get in touch with the Pope when the Pope came to Dili uh, some years ago. He'd been arrested and tortured for that. He managed to get out uh, to Lisbon and he'd come over to the United States. And what was extraordinary was that without any sense of irony, Donanciano and I spoke to each other. I knew him Portuguese. His English was very shaky. We spoke to each other happily in Indonesian. That was the language of communication between us. So the idea that 